We're about uh, sort of 80 people in size uh, now. And uh, we're, we're sort of mainly based in, in Cheltenham and London, but we've just opened recently an office in Bristol. And um, I thought, I, I spoke to Nick way back in February and said it would be great to sort of say hello to the kind of British tech community and, and introduce ourselves. Um, and uh, uh, back, back then, this seemed like a, a sort of, um, you know, a kind of, um, uh, you know, this is well before COVID. So um, we're kind of, uh, it, it's maybe, maybe not what I had in mind when I signed up for this, but uh, yeah, th thank you all for coming anyhow. And this is, us, uh, this is us opening the Bristol office here. This is our CEO, Jeremy and Maria, who, um, who uh, kind of set up all the, um, the, the, the office and everything. It's right by uh, Bristol Temple Mead. So that's kind of our, uh, I suppose this company was sort of seeing it as a great way to kind of um, tap into some of the 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 the, 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 te the techies in in Bristol. Uh, so we're hoping to grow the office um, kind of this year, basically. Uh, so Ripjar is a company that uh, you know uses data science and artificial intelligence um, to protect com companies from money laundering, uh, fraud, cybercrime, and terrorism. And uh, yeah, we, we managed to get a shout out from the Prime Minister at Davos uh, in 2018. So we were very you know, very pleased to get that. So it, it gets wheeled out in nearly every presentation we do. Uh, but uh, um, so I, what, what I'd like to do today is, is talk to you a little bit about that, that first problem, um, kind of money laundering, uh, and a little bit about, you know, kind of um, other types of financial crime as well. And then, um, and then I, I'm going to then sort of talk about some of the work that we're, we're kind of doing at Ripjar, but still in relatively early stages, um, about the uh, use of knowledge graphs for detecting uh, such crimes as well. Uh, so, I suppose that the, the problem really with money laundering is, you know, w w when someone steals money or, 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 or acquires money illegally, they need to try and make it look legitimate. And so, money laundering is the way of kind of mixing it with legitimate money, uh, such that when it comes out of the system again, you can't really tell where it's come from or the, the fact that it is, you know, the proceeds of crime. And, you know, globally, they, they reckon this is about 2 to 5% of GDP, which is... You know those enormous numbers there 800 billion dollars to two trillion dollars um, per year is estimated by the UN to be um, you know being laundered per year um, there, there's a, if you want to hear more about this by the way there's a, an excellent podcast by called the dark money files uh, which is run by one of our kind of company advisors um, which is you know just really sort of interesting how how these kind of operations are pulled off but I'm going to very you know briefly talk about you know some of the scale of them here but you can see these are some of the scandals. This is by, by the European Council. Um, you can see some of the scandals here. You know, some of them are sort of eye-watering values, you know, particularly, you know, Danske Bank, they're $230 billion, you know, laundered through, through the bank there. Uh, and these are, these are all within, you know, the, the, the EU there. Um, and so, you know, what does a money laundering network look like? Well, they're usually very complicated, involving lots and lots of companies in lots of different jurisdictions. And the idea really is to sort of keep moving the money around until it's so complicated that nobody can quite remember where it came from in the first place. And so, you know, in this case, you've got $230 million stolen from the Russian Treasury. And then it went through, you know, a series of, of companies um, and ended up in a Cypriot bank uh, down here called FBME. Um, but you can see here, um, you can see, get a feel for sort of how international it is. You know, you've got here sort of addresses in the British Virgin Islands. You've got, you know, some addresses in Moscow here. And, and you get lots of sort of interesting kind of telltale signs of kind of the mass production of companies. So, for example, 16 other companies that have the same address as Bank Bank Ventures there in the middle. You know, and, you know, a lot of this is an artifact that, you know, you kind of need, if you, if you, if you, were, if you were hypothetically a criminal and you had 230 million uh, dollars of stolen money you, you you don't really you you kind of want control of, of all this kind of aspect so you often get kind of leaks between you know the fact that they've, they've got you know registered at the same address and so on you know have the same beneficial owner um, you know many different kind of artifacts like that are kind of detectable as well as indeed the crime itself you know the theft of 230 million is often quite difficult to hide in the first place so all these different kind of aspects go into detecting uh, money laundering and financial crime um, you know, around the world. So um, I, I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of, you know, one of the techniques that we're applying to a particular sort of aspect of this, which is related to knowledge graphs. So uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with knowledge, knowledge graphs. So I'm, I'm just going to start assuming, assuming not. Um, so here, here is a definition. It, it's quite, they're quite woolly, um, 
you know, it's not a very crisp concept, I would say, knowledge graphs, but here is a definition. So knowledge graphs are large networks of entities, their semantic types, properties, and relationships between the entities. Um, so this doesn't quite capture everything, because I, I think there's certainly an element with knowledge graphs about the machine readability of the data as well. You know, a computer can read and understand the, the information and the data within it. Um, further, I, you know, the word knowledge sort of indicates that this is, you know, high quality data. It's not, you know, sort of random bits of data sort of lying around. It's, you know, very well curated and understood data that is known to be true, um, which is kind of an interesting uh, other point as well. And so, um, you know, an example of, of a really good, um, perhaps my favorite knowledge graph is Wikidata. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's a kind of another project by the Wikipedia, the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, and it's kind of like a structured um, uh, uh, Wikipedia, but you can see here, here is Albert Einstein and you get, you get statements like this, you know, he's an instance of a human uh, and things like that. You know, you've kind of got this kind of very regimented format that allows you to express, you know, all the different properties about a particular type of entity in, in a sort of very formal and, and understandable way uh, where you can understand what, what's going on. And so our goal at Ripjar is to produce uh, uh, the world's largest kind of financial crime risk graph. So um, we're, we're actually starting with, you know, a, a lot of sort of uh, kind of sanctions and watch lists and government data and, and the news data as well, which is kind of our sort of background as natural language processing. We're trying to sort of curate all that together into a, um, a feed of kind of, you know, individuals that are linked or connected to risk in, in some capacity. Um, and so I'm, I'm just going to sort of dive right in with the, the technical details a bit. So um, this is kind of what we're, we're, we're aiming to do. So, uh, you know, on the left here, we're taking in unstructured text. So uh, things like the news and on the right, structured sources as well. So by that, I mean things like Wikidata, uh, also the, the watch list data itself, which is put together by governments about kind of risky individuals and, and companies, um, you know, they're, they're kind of, uh, you sort of very, you know, sort of JSON formatted or XML formatted records with a very well known structure. So uh, we, we're going to put this in, and then, you know, obviously with the unstructured text, you need to do a series of extractions to turn it into a sort of graph like form. You need to add that structure in yourself, you know, entity extraction, relationship extraction to pull out, you know, people and the relationships between them. Uh, and then what we do, that, do then is format it into a standard kind of input, input format called a data graph. Uh, and kind of the, the difficult bit now, having, having you know, pre-processed all the data and so on, um, is, is then this kind, of, this kind of step here, the entity resolution, which is, you know, is this person uh, mentioned in the news the same as this person on the watch list? Uh, and often, you know, it can be quite easy if you have lots of additional properties there, but sometimes the, the data provided doesn't quite align or, you, you, you know, you maybe have a, a fuzzy date of birth or, or, or so on. And so this is kind of a real, you know, a real challenge in, in, in these kind of, you know, sort of ambiguous worlds where you, you, you know, particularly like the news and, and certain, you know, aspects of the watch list data where you don't have, you know, full you know, identifying information like a, a unique ID or something. And then the output of that then is, is a knowledge graph where you have these resolved entities with all the data about a single, you know, uh, a single real world entity in one place in a normalized machine readable form which then allows you to do things like reasoning over the top of it or running further models uh, on top of it as well. So just to sort of make the point again, you know, we've got sort of two types of input really. We've got this sort of normalized data graph, as we call it, um, from text, whereby you have thousands of little snippets of the graph. So for example, if you imagine Donald Trump and how many news articles he might be in, in our 5 billion news article collection, you, you sort of get an idea but you know the, the the redundancy and the amount of, of, of volume of data that we get there. Whereas in something like Wikidata, if you looked at Donald Trump again, there'd be one entry for Donald Trump, and you know it'd be already deduplicated. And Wikidata is obviously a much bigger source than an individual news article. So you know we kind of got to take all these different um, uh, uh, sort of aspects of the input. Um, and so really, you know, we're kind of sort of almost solving three different problems here. You know matching news to itself to resolve entities within the news, matching the news to a structured graph, and also matching structured graphs to other structured graphs, each of which have, you know, these different distributions of frequencies of appearance and, you know, types and nature of data as well. So we've kind of sort of put this pipeline together, which, um, you know, has a, you know, initially we kind of look at different name variants, um, you know, particularly sort of cross-lingual, you know, various permutations like titles, middle names, you know, 
the standard kind of things. And then we uh, resolve identities to say, you know, are these two identities similar or not? Uh, then, then we have this thing which is called a relationship map. So obviously this is a network, uh, a graph of, of, of entities and their relationships to each other, you know, father of, you know, works for, etc. Um, uh, and so that those kind of you know, relationships can really help you and indeed are absolutely pivotal in understanding identity. Uh, and then, you know, having decided who's who, you then need to sort of merge, um, you know, create, update the knowledge graph in some way. And, you know, often it might be the right thing is that we don't have enough information to change the knowledge graph in this situation. So it's, it's a very broad topic, entity resolution, but I'm just going to zoom in on relationship matching because I, I think it's quite fascinating. It sort of illustrates some of the problems within, uh, within entity resolution. <clears throat> so here is a, uh, uh, two records um, that, that we've got, let, let's say. Uh, they're both related to James Smith. Um, I'm afraid but the, the names I've pulled out here aren't very imaginative uh, in this example, so I, I do apologise. But yeah, we've, got, we've got sort of some properties on both that are in common. You know, we've got a broad date, date of birth match and a name match. So that's probably quite a weak you know, sort of indicator that they're the same entity. So we've, we've scored it at sort of 0.85, which may or may not be, uh, this is sort of a thought, a thought example, I suppose, may or may not be um, good enough to match. But what's interesting is then we have this surrounding graph. So in this case, you know, we've, we, we've captured the, the fact that uh, the Jane Smith on the left is married to this John Smith in the top left hand corner with all these properties and the same again in, in the right. And if you look, they're actually, you know, the, the two John Smiths there are very, very similar. So we've got the same relationship to very similar entities there. We've also got this other relationship down here and Jane in this case works for Ripjar on the right hand side. Now, of course, the, the fact that Jane has this in, in common, you know, so, so these two John Smiths are very common. Uh, sorry, are, are very closely related. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're, they've got a lot of information in common, date of birth, nationality, address, passport number. So, you know, that would be a very, very strong match. But now, of course, you've got this sort of circuit here, which sort of indicates that, in fact, you really need to be using the, you know, the network information to inform, you know, is this James Smith the same, um, uh, the, the, indeed the same entity? And so, you know, using that kind of pattern, we can then, you know, sort of, further boost the, the, the similarity between Jane Smith here in, in, this, in this kind of way. Um, and, you know, having, having then sort of done that kind of relationship matching, you then need to do you know, sort of merging, splitting, creating, updating. Uh, so this is kind of consolidating all that information together, which is actually, you know, so you're going from something like this, um, as we had before, to something like that. Now, um, this may appear quite, quite straightforward, but you're actually kind of merging here two entities, two relationships, all the properties within them. Uh, and then also there's a series of other considerations as well. Uh, you know, this is this Jane Smith here is now from multiple sources. So what does that mean for, you know, uh, you know, firstly, the provenance, how we know what we know, um, you know, so for some of these properties, we now have multiple sources of information for them. Um, we, we also have, you know, the, the notion of kind of confidence, you know, how confident are we? in these different properties, some of which we've now seen multiple times, some of which we've only seen once you know, from different sources. Um, so, you know, for example, the date of birth, you know, we had um, a very sort of narrow the 21st of December 1984 matched to just 1984, which is a very broad, broad you know, what, what should the date of birth be in, in this merged entity and with what confidence? Um, you know, there's kind of all, all these kind of sort of the merging and the curation of confidence over time is kind of a very important part of understanding, you know, what is knowledge and how well you really know something. Um, you know, another, another thing uh, which is kind of a bit of an open question for us at the moment is how do you mix different sources where you have different trust in, you know, for example, the nature of the data. So for example, a government provided watch list, you might trust very much, you know, you might trust Wikidata less than that, and you might trust a kind of a uh, news article that's been extracted um, through a series of, um, you know, kind of neural networks, uh, to, you know, uh, the, the mistakes that can come out of that, you know, you might trust that significantly less again. And how do you combine all that into, in, in, into you know, <laughs> some, some, you know, fact score that, you know, you trust or don't trust this, um, th this fact. Um, and also, you know, when, when should we include it? You know, if, if we don't have enough uh, identifying information should we put it in or if we're not sure whether um, an entity is the same as another one or we're not sure about a fact when 
it, can we promote something to be called you know, knowledge, as in it's a known um, sort of aspect. Um, and so uh, I suppose we've been working on this for a, for a little bit. We, we kind of, um, you know, there's quite a lot of problems within this larger problem, uh, which, which I could speak about for, for ages, but I, I think, you know, the purpose of tonight is a kind of, I suppose, a lightning talk. So I, I've just sort of hopefully whetted your appetite. I'd like to finish though with a, um, a demonstration of kind of where we have got to. And so uh, this is actually following um, uh, a, 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 uh, a corruption case, actually an embezzlement case um, that happened in Bangladesh. Um, this is the former prime minister, uh, Khaled Azir, uh, who was, uh, 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 I, think, I think she's in prison at the moment, actually, for um, embezzling funds from, uh, from a foreign aid ag agency that was giving them to an orphanage. Um, so it's a sort of fairly you know, horrendous crime, um, if, if it's indeed true. And so th this kind of shows you how we've managed to sort of pull together you know, a couple of different sources, including the data from the news, to be able to kind of illustrate um, you know, the, the, the connections to risk. And you know, um, please bear in mind that a lot of this has come from the news and has come through a kind of natural language processing pipeline. So um, please use your imagination as to kind of how, how we've got here, but it's, it's, it still strikes me as remarkable the fact that you can add so much structure to text um, you know, uh, with, with the kind of advances in natural language processing. Uh, so this is uh, also just a little bit about the tool you're going to see. This is our kind of investigations platform that allows you to kind of visualize a network graph view. I mean, the knowledge graph itself is obviously a data sort of product, if you like, and then this is then being loaded in this kind of visual form. So please try and, in your mind, separate what you see from you know, the underlying data as well, uh, which I would describe the underlying data as the knowledge graph itself. So, uh, okay. I think that's enough introduction. <laughs> so um, hopefully this is running out. Yeah, so what I'm going to do uh, in this video is I query for um, Kaleida Zia here onto our knowledge graph number 43, uh, which was a, a good vintage. Um, and, it, and, it, and it, you know, so, so what this is going to do is query into the knowledge graph and we're going to load a one hop kind of network surrounding Kaleida Zia here. Um, Kaleida Zia is that node in the middle. I don't know if you can make it out, but um, in a second, I, I think we, <clears throat> and these are all the relationships that we've extracted and found from her. So she, she um, here is, you know, we, we pulled out the fact that she's um, from Bangladesh and she's a female. Um, and uh, what we're going to do now is just show you some of the underlying kind of provenance here. So these are some news articles about Kaleida Zia. You can see, you know, I don't know if you can read the articles there, but they've kind of got extracted entities within them. And then also for Kaleida Zia, we've got this kind of watch list record here where it reveals that she's, um, you know, the former Prime Minister of Bangladesh. So now we're going to look at some of the relationships that, that have been um, pulled out, in particular the connection to bribery and corruption over here on the, on the left. <laughs> and so when we click on a relationship here, we're going to see the, um, I, I think some of the hi highlighting is a little bit off on some of these, but it highlights the exact kind of sentence whereby um, you know, that's as charged with, so Kaleida Zira is charged with bribery and corruption. And you can then see the kind of underlying provenance, the underlying sentence from which that came. You can also see, so this one is, was convicted of, and um, this one is sentenced with. So you can see as we sort of progress through that kind of court case, we were capturing, you know, kind of each stage of the connection to that, to that risk as it went through. Um, and that was all kind of extracted from the news. Um, so the, uh, I think, so what I'm going to do now is kind of spider out another hop around the edge of the graph, um, which kind of shows that you know, the, this kind of scale of it. I think, I think, um, uh, I, th I think there's kind of, uh, I think this graph in particular had about sort of 20 million entities in it. So we're just looking at a little tiny corner of it at this point. <laughs> um, the kind of gray entities here are directly from the watch list data. So the, this bit of the, the graph there is kind of, has come just from the watch list data only. Um, the pink, the pink coloured uh, nodes are from the, the news. Uh, and I think we, when we go up in a second, we can sort of see you know, some of the, um, so, so uh, we're about to click on a link, I think, where the, um, there was no watch list data available. So this link here, we actually, the watch list data didn't seem to include one of their children 
here. Um, and so that connection has come, you know, kind of only uh, from the news in this case. Uh, and so that kind of just gives you a flavor for, you know, the, the, the kind of sort of, I suppose the, the, the idea with this knowledge graph is then to kind of put together this kind of data fabric on top of which we can then find, you know, these patterns and links to, in this case, crimes. But then as, you know, as we go on, we've now got a home for these kind of soft correlators about, you know, same address, you know, uh, unusual patterns of, um, uh, of, of accounting and so on which then, you know, kind of all aggregate up to be able to help you find kind of different, you know, uh, sort, of, sort of causes of financial crime and different actors involved in that network. Uh, and that's kind of where we're going uh, at the moment. We, we kind of already work with a, a kind of number of banks on, on very related problems. And this is our kind of sort of next generation, um, I, I suppose, a, approach in terms of, at the moment, the kind of banks would do a lot of kind of you know, media analysis uh, in this way, watch this analysis, and it's all kind of quite separate. Uh, and so the, the kind of idea here is that we can kind of, you know, pull it all together and produce that kind of holistic view uh, of risks and aggregate them over time. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, I, said, uh, I said at the start, we're, we're hiring, um, including in Bristol, and uh, we've kind of, this is just sort of one of, one of many interesting problems that we're working on. Uh, we have a lot of kind of, you know, natural language processing, uh, style problems in data science. We've got we, we've got a, you know this five billion news article collection, and so we're kind of looking for a lot of sort of data engineers to help us. Uh, we have a kind of Spark cluster on which we which we use to kind of process it all. So um, you know, and that, that's kind of our, uh, our, our th those are the sorts of, of of things that we're working on at Bridgeart. So thank you. I, I I hope that was neither too long nor too short, Nick. <laughs> but, uh... That is absolutely spot on. So so maybe and um, we could ask everyone to unmute. Uh, themselves so that we can show our appreciation for, for you Simon so thank you thank you very much thank you <laughs> um, so we'll have a few uh, questions and um, if there are any on the chat Chris if you want to um, curate those that'd be great yeah, so we've got three. We've got three questions on the chat from James Timms, Andy Seaborn, and Ashtonio. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I'll take the first one because they're all equally good, uh, and I'm quite curious about it too. Um, so, you, you've got five billion news articles. Mm -hmm. You've got Companies House. Um, are you also uh, analysing and incorporating other data sources? I mean, so James Timms. Is asking about the Panama Papers. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's loads of sources that we can add, and you know, they're they're the kind of, you know, absolutely they're kind of what we want to add. We haven't added them yet. Uh, I think we at the moment we're in that sort of phase of just getting that core fabric right. Um, uh, you know, we've I, we think we've cracked it. So I think we're kind of really excited about where we can go with it going forwards, and um, you know, adding in those sources, those additional sources of risk, the kind of reasoning and so on. I think will come. But I, for, for me, you know, the 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 you know the base of this has to be around. You know, <laughs> is your identity good? Is do you trust the data? Do you have a good way of aggregating it? And I think I think they're the sort of fundamental cornerstones that allow you to then you know, with accuracy, say, you know, this, this, um, you know, this entity is one on the Panama Papers. Um, we, I, I think that, that they're the sorts of, you know, absolutely, they're, they're great sources and we're, we're, we're looking at adding them very shortly. Cool. Thank you. Um, Andy Seaborn, do you, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? If you're still here. Yeah, I'm there, sorry. Yeah, I was wondering what technologies you use to storage, store and manage the data <clears throat> once, once you've gone through the, the extraction and identification process, and then how do you reuse that information? Um, so, well, I suppose, I suppose the, you know, the, the kind of base news data we store are just, just in raw HDFS, um, which, uh, you know, Hadoop file system. Um, we kind of then process it and store it, um, you know, in the same place. We also have, you know, index that sometimes in Elasticsearch, depending on the, the application. The, the kind of knowledge graph itself, um, we haven't really settled on a, a choice at the moment, but the, at the moment we're using something called Janus Graph, um, which is a kind of knowledge graph 
application that's built on top of you can have different backends, but one of them includes HBase, uh, which is you know obviously plays very nicely in the the um, Spark cluster that we've got. So so that's what we're using. Um, you know, I, I know from any knowledge graphs, there, there's you know the, the other big technology that gets used is is kind of RDF style triple stores. Um, we haven't gone down that route. I think I think having used them before, I, I find having a data model that's a bit more you know kind of coalesced around you know, an entity and, you know, I, you get back a person rather than, you know, a person node where the name is a separate property, you know, and I, I think, I think, you know, it's, it's a kind of, kind of a property graph style format um, that, that we currently use. Um, but we are, we are toying with some, some swapping that out, as I say, I, I think, um, I think that's certainly something we're looking at in the near future. Okay, cool. Um, so I mean I don't know if we we probably want to move on to the panel Nick don't we we have more questions uh, maybe one one more question yeah and then we'll do panel okay sounds good uh, Ashtonio do you want to unmute yourself and uh, ask your question yeah sure <clears throat> so I was going to say where you're dealing with criminals and people that are already to set up winding account structures etc to keep themselves hidden um we if, if people have knowledge of these sort of systems scouting around and linking people up amongst different companies uh how do you prevent these people trying to undermine the sources of truth that you ingest in order to make those decisions in terms of is there is there the ability for them to pollute news sites with conflicting information or false information that might mislead the knowledge graphs and also could they i don't know lie to companies house or other other activities that might uh, mess with it if they put in different dates of birth or different identifiable data gosh um i mean that's that's a really interesting question i think i suppose pragmatically at the moment you know the i think the bar is quite low in terms of what people aren't doing <laughs> i think you know just simply doing basic checks is kind of you know uh, and making sure they're good is kind of the first stage i think you know that that ability to influence something i think is fascinating and I suppose the, you know, I haven't really thought about the fact that they could nefariously, you know, sort of change the the shape of information out there on the web. That's quite an interesting thought, um, one that I will now worry about. I mean, I, I think there is the notion of trust is kind of built in, you know, built into these and different trusted sources. I think, for example, you know, would it be possible for an actor to have an article written in the New York Times or you know there's a sort of level of of you know <laughs> if if they can do that then they're probably you know already they've already won in some ways versus having a blog on, on their website you know there's, there's probably a scale of risk um and i think again it comes down to trust um i mean even you have this problem even um without nefarious actors it should be said in that you know some news sites will print stories that aren't true um i um you know, for example, I'm thinking about the, the sort of Barack Obama kind of birther scandal, you know, where, where lots of people were reporting he was actually born in Kenya um, when he, you know, he wasn't, you know, and, and these things get reported in, in the news. Um, and, and I think even without such, um, you know, worry about people doing it, I think that level of, you know, can you believe information from these sources and how can you aggregate it? And I think that's where that kind of trust element in a source comes in and, and so I, I think it's probably it's a great question that's kind of got me thinking about you know well lots of things really but I, I think that that kind of trust element would be sort of core to it all I suppose. Great thanks thanks, Thank, thanks for that Simon um, so we're going to last um, 40 minutes we're going to invite a couple of um, people to um, join on to uh, a panel and so I'd like to introduce Adrian Shedden who's co-founder of Lumio and also Glenn Smith who is founder of Rocket. Um, and uh, so maybe uh, an opening uh, question for, for, for the panel. Um, I'd like to like just like, focus a little bit on, on the technology itself. Um, and could, could we just sort of outline maybe some of the key differences between a knowledge graph and uh, a, a database? I mean, what, what are the essential differences be between these two things? Um, do you, do you you know, will I have a go at that one, Simon? <laughs> I, I think I think I think you should, yeah. Yeah, just uh, <laughs> um, sure. I've been a 
uh, I'm founder of a company called Rocket based in Bath. We're now looking at a, at a payments network, which is going to need to have some anti-money laundering stuff running over the top of it, hence my interest in this subject now. But to pull it back, the knowledge graphs have actually been working over the last four or five years in building knowledge graphs, one for enterprise-based knowledge systems, and then secondly, uh, uh, for enterprise skill-based knowledge systems as well in terms of employment skills. And uh, I'm trying to build knowledge graphs. I think Jake, uh, Simon's got a good job there of showing you there's a lot of noise and it's an inexact science. When we, we think about databases, we think about tight data structures and structured data and, uh, and nicely organized data and knowledge, knowledge graphs in general. Ultimately, that's what you want to produce. But trying to produce it is a lot messier than you would like. As, a, as, as tech guys, we sort of like clean solutions and an absolute answer, and that is not what you get when you're trying to build a knowledge graph. Uh, and a lot of this stuff happens around categorization as well. We were building knowledge graphs. What does an AI knowledge graph look like for artificial intelligence and machine learning tech? Categories fall into various buckets and how you label them was actually a really arduous task. And every expert out there had a different sort of categorization structure in their mind and stuff like that. So it's really hard to get agreement because a lot of the stuff in a knowledge graph is actually subjective when you're trying to categorize knowledge. And that makes it a lot harder than just a database, if you like, when you're trying to do that. So what, what, does, what, what does good look like then for, like for, for a knowledge graph? How, how can you define a quality of what a good graph is? I mean, I, I think the, you know, the, the it, it, to some degree, it, 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 what you're trying to model is not the, the, the data you have, but the world <laughs> that you're trying to represent. You know, you, you're, you're modeling people, organizations, things that, you know, um, have a life outside of your system. And I, I think really, that, therefore, it, it comes down to, you know, I mean, to some degree, there is an element of what you believe you will be able to populate in them. You know, you can't model the entire world. And I, th I think, you know, also focusing on a particular problem allows it to be, you know, kind of tractable. But, but ultimately, it's that, you know, this is a person, this is how we represent the information. And therefore, I need to do that in such a general way that I can then model, you know, any person I see in any data source is, is ultimately the way you're trying to do it. So the way to do that is to reflect, you know, the reality of, of the situation, uh, I think I would say. And, and so, you know, just to sort of um, back up, um, you know, Glenn's point, it's kind of, I always see a knowledge graph as starting from, it's almost top down, you know, in kind of what do you want at the end? Whereas, you know, often usually with databases, you start with bottom up and, you know, I'm sure we've all created fields called, you know, text field three and things like this, which, which you know, just don't really mean anything, but a, a useful place to squirrel a little bit of data in from your system and so on. So I, I think, you know, that's the main difference that I, that I see and, and, and uh, you know, good would be a good representation of, of the world and therefore you can easily slot data in about those things into it. Okay. But, but in, the, in the banking domain, traditionally, the data has been fairly sharded. Like e each bank is, is, is sort of guarding its own uh, data quite carefully. Um, so, so is that problematic in, the, in this case or is that it's not a problem because you're just building an out external picture of the, of the world? Well, no. So I, I think, you know, the, the model, the, so what I'm talking about is the data model, the data structure, the schema, if you like, of the data, um, which has to reflect the real, the real world. And then, you know, a bank would have its own set of clients and so on, you know, companies and people, um, you know, are the only sort of legal entities that can open bank accounts and so on. So, you know, th th therefore, you know, it, it, it sort of maps in, you know, relatively well into the, you know, into, into a knowledge graph format. And, and you know it's that kind of for for finding you know fighting crime it is just really about pulling together lots of different sources and having a, a suitably general model um to pull everything together so i was just going to say something then so in terms of the world which doesn't st stand still and is continuously evolving mm -hmm. how does the how does ripjar and your knowledge graph evolve to keep pace with that uh, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, it, it is perhaps, you know, a knowledge graph, it is just a case of, you know, adding new fields and so on as necessary. I don't think there's any need to be, you know, hugely pure and theoretical about things, but I think it is just a, 
It's simply a case of saying, you know, for, I mean, the, the example I always think of it is in the, in text, you know, you say, ah, oh, you know, some of those relationships that we had on there is, um, you know, father of, uh, or, or spouse of, for example, but, you know, uh, spouse of, you can have, um, you know, you, you can change, you know, your spouse and so on over time. You can have historic things. You can have in, in text, you might even see sentences like so-and-so, so-and-so will get married tomorrow. Um, and, and you know that, that this there's there are all these kind of sort of subtle differences in you know what exactly does your information mean and I think it's more about capturing the meaning of the data in a way and therefore that means you can then reason about things so you know a classic use of knowledge graphs is that like a reasoning engine so you know if, if I say you know um, you know here's a person and this is their mother and I know their mother as well I also know that original person must therefore have a grandparent of the other one. You know, you can just do simple logical pieces of reasoning. And by, you know, making that accessible, the meaning of the data, it means you can then start to, you know, reason over it and feed it into, you know, other pieces of information that are going to then tell you new things that you didn't know. Uh, and, and, you know, provide that ability to, you know, pull information together in, in that way. And I think that's the kind of concept about it. I don't, I don't know if I'm Glenn <laughs> or yeah, you've got, got, you got another angle on it. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely do that. I'll do the complete reverse angle. Um, under sort of Adrian's question, there's a subtle underlying assumption there that uh, we sort of have this right now and the data might change and therefore we're not going to have it. It's actually the opposite of that. The world currently is really a messy, messy place and money launderers are very, very good at making the world an even messier place. They hide their trails if they're moving the money around from fraudulent uh, acquisition of it. So therefore, we actually don't have any tools at the moment really that are really, really good at this globally that do this well. And that's one of the cool things that Ripjar are doing now. They're, tr they're, they're having a go at trying to crack that problem in a, in a clever way using the latest NLP, et cetera. And, uh, and, I, and I think it's not a matter of can we keep up as it moves. We just, we, we're not, I don't think we're even really close at the moment to be able to do that well already. So the, a knowledge graph is a technique to be able to do that but they're just hard to build and hence one of the reasons why even with all the latest advances in AI and NLP etc we're still struggling to build that well the flip side of that is I do think that the huge language models that we've seen coming out of the likes of Google and Microsoft uh, etc and OpenAI are beginning to understand language at a scale that we that that has not been able to be done in the past these huge amounts of hyper parameters in these mo latest models that they produced let's the model understand language and the subtleties of the language a lot, lot better than they used to do even, even a couple of years ago. And I think, I'm not sure if you're using some of those latest sort of models uh, uh, such as uh, GDP3 out of OpenAI or not yet, Simon, but those are the sort of things that are, are going to be able to help move that state of the art forward to begin to make these deductions that Simon talked about without having to add in the logic rules the systems are going to begin to create those rules and those links themselves. So that will make our ability to generate these knowledge graphs much better in the future. I don't think that techniques have been applied at scale yet to this problem, but I think that's probably one of the ways it's going to go in the future. So how, so how, how can the banks be motivated, do you think, to, to adopt more of this technology? Do they, do they need to be motivated? Is that the fact that um, money laundering is going on is the motivator or are there other motivators for banks to, to, you know, to, to close down on these things? I mean, um, that might be your question, Adrian, more than ours. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking that that's actually a regulatory motivator. And then, uh, in terms of things like Panama Papers coming out, I think, uh, was it James that, uh, or Ashtonia that asked the question of the data sources? It, it does strike me that the banks, to a certain extent, you know, if we think about the types of uh, financial crime that occur, one of which is tax evasion and one person's tax avoidance is another person's tax evasion. So, and some people, some entities like banks and lawyers and accountants are very much, uh, I'll say complicit in facilitating some of those structures that by some people are perceived as legal and some people are perceived as illegal. And so there is an inherent conflict of interest in shutting these things down, which is why then uh, in some parts, which is why then it is mandated from a uh, legal and regulatory standpoint. But you're starting to see things like open banking, um, making certain banking data more widely available. That then means that you might actually start 
seeing people that don't have that conflict of interest come in and start uh, exposing the data even more. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's actually from a technological standpoint, it'd be great to get Glenn and Simon's feedback on that, but whether that maybe prizes it open a little bit more so that the technology can keep up with the evolving world and the data. Yeah, I, I think the motivation for banks to take this on is that, as you say, they're under a regulatory uh, obligation. I mean, for people that don't know, um, you know, if you have, if you're found to be poor at preventing money laundering, the fines are becoming eye-watering to the point where companies face existential threats if they get fined for, for doing them. I, I, I'm thinking, you know, that uh, there was a case in um, in Mexico. I think it was um, well, one of the big banks. Um, I, th I think their fine was $1.3 billion, you know, by the US. Um, the, it was money coming through from Mexico from a narcotics cartel into the US. You know, $1.3 billion fine um, from the US there. Uh, and, you know, that's the kind of thing, you know, I think that isn't even the biggest fine that's been, that's been put out there. You know, they're, they're being fined billions of dollars. And I think that tends to motivate banks to, to be good at this. I, I think then they're pouring people into this to prevent getting these fines. And therefore, I think now, I think the, you know, a lot of regulators are saying, for example, you must screen your, uh, this is a new one that's coming out, which is kind of what Richard sort of already contributes really is, you know, you must screen your clients against the news, particularly, you know, high risk individuals and so on, which is something that we've started doing. But obviously at the moment, you know, you've got this lots of people going into it and it's very inefficient. And I think now the drive is for that, you know, efficiency and with, you know, you can both do more for less, I think, if you get the right tooling in place, the right data formatted in the right way. And I think, you know, what also it's this, you know, at the moment there's like a screening your watch list, screening against media, doing your um, transaction monitoring, uh, all separate things. But I think when you look at the actual network, you realize that they're all, you know, it's one problem with these different aspects to it. And I think, you know, you're gonna get advantages from it and efficiency. So I think the bank are interested in the efficiencies, the regulator are interested in the, you know the the the, the effectiveness of, of the tool. So I, I think that's kind of what's driving the the market. And you know, like I think they call it like reg tech. Uh, you know, regulatory uh, technology. You know, how can you help people comply with regulations? It's quite a big, a big industry. Um, right. so, so within that, NL, NLP is presumably is going to figure quite 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 highly as a as the technology evolves. And and like and so any any sort of final final comment before we yeah. bring the, the panel to a close. And just put it back to the core of one of uh, the questions here around open banking, as we mentioned, what the changes that are coming with open banking. One of your original questions, Nick, was around the fact that banks have all this data and they don't really give it away very much. And that's definitely been historically been the case. But open banking as, as a wave is going around the world now where people can open up. The regulators have, uh, want to create more competition from fintech startups, uh, et cetera, for, to create new services that the banks themselves haven't been creating. And in the back of that, there is now the opportunity to begin to uh, share data and open up that banking data to other networks if the, those companies are permitted to do that. And one of the use cases definitely could be in that in terms of just looking for uh, anti-money laundering network that might make sense to have as a, a, central, a central entity that does that, as a central European type entity that would just do that job and suck in all that data. That would be an interesting project to run if you think about it. Uh, there you go, there's, a, there's some sort of European uh, sponsored project to do that. I would imagine that would make, make a lot of sense. Uh, the sort of stuff we're we're beginning to have that effect and what we're trying to do with Rocket with a payments network now, and we're only see the idea that we could actually span all the banks of the country and begin to see data across all those banks within our network and transactional history of that stuff and begin to potentially have more data than some of the individual banks to begin to piece some of these pieces of the puzzle together as well. And that's why uh, the anti money laundering stuff and the sort of work that Simon's doing at the moment is, is really quite interesting to us as well. Not just as wobbly data in that in that fact as well, because we will have KYC official government sanctioned data identifying each of the entities in a, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the transactions that we see and the owners of the transactions that we see so that there's there's actually an element of having a slightly less messy knowledge graph in that space to apply AML type technologies to as well. And and finally Adrian is, is this also relevant for, for Lumio and what and what you're doing? Um, yeah it is to, to a certain extent uh, in terms of the facilitating payments but the my main closing thought was in terms of the from the regulators perspective and how you know a lot of this is being done from a, a private perspective and historically the regulators 
in the UK at least, didn't really have the teeth. They didn't have the knowledge. They didn't have the um, the financial sanctions. And they, they're gradually getting more teeth. I would argue even 1.6 billion on some of the bank's balance sheets is still not eye-watering or existential, an existential threat. So they're gradually getting bigger teeth. But also they're arming themselves from within by running things like um, AML and financial crime tech sprints and really starting to bring in more of the data science um, and technical aspects into the regulator themselves. Uh, and they're, they're sharing that with other regulators. So it'd be really interesting to see how the regulators themselves start to take more charge. Great. 